Allah, you're the source of life and you're the source of truth. To obey you, I strive and my aim is pleasing you. Allah, you are the only one, your promise is always true. You don't need anyone, but we're all in need of you. And I sincerely pray to be among the ones you love. And until my final day, I say in all my prayers, Raditu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful All praise and thanks are due to Allah And peace and blessings be upon his messenger Dear brothers and sisters Welcome to a new episode of our daily show Discovering Islam Allah says in the Quran In Al-Umran 3, 164 Certainly did Allah confer great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they had been before in manifest error. Islam is a great gift from Allah that rescued people at the time and every time and guided them to the straight path of good life. For more about this type of struggle to lead a good life, we are pleased to meet our brother, Mr. Ali Tyner from United States. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, uh, may you introduce yourself to our viewers? Um, my former name, although it's still official, is Alexander Christopher Tyner, kind of long, so I chose Ali Tyner instead. Uh, the, my inspiration for choosing Ali was uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to remember all of the Sahaba's names, but unfortunately, remembering names is very difficult for me. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, and what do you do in Kuwait? I came here in 2008 of December, originally as a field technician for a company named Corpro. They have a contract with KOC, or Kuwait Oil Company. I see. Uh, when was your first encounter with Islam? The first time that I remember hearing about Islam was when I was 13, after my family and I had moved to Saudi Arabia from McAllen, Texas. I see. And at that time, uh, <laughs> being a teenager, uh, mm -hmm. I was only interested in, not, in school and not getting into trouble. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the two things that I did know uh, that I had heard about was uh, that Muslims didn't eat pork or drink alcohol. Yeah. That it was that both of them were forbidden mm -hmm. to them. Okay. And, and and before uh, knowing anything about Islam, uh, when when you met and saw Muslims and you knew they they don't eat pork, how you felt about it? At that time, I don't remember my reaction. I became more interested when I came into Kuwait a few years ago, as I said. And the first one, the first person I started having more conversations with about why Muslims don't eat pork, mm -hmm. okay. I know very little about them, but I don't want to go into what I do know about them. Yeah. <laughs> All I will say was that one of the things that he used to do for me was show me videos on YouTube mm -hmm. of how pigs live and some of the more biological reasons. Okay. So uh, this uh, Muslim was trying to show you about the pork. Yeah, uh, specifically about to, that. To convince you that uh, that's why we don't eat it. Yes. Okay, I see. Uh, what image you had about Muslims before this encounter? Nothing. No thought. Zero information. N nothing. Okay. I had no impressions, no problems. I'm a people person, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's okay. I either get along with you or I don't. Yeah. Uh, that's just how it is for me, I guess. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I see. And what happened next that uh, 
attracted you to learn more about Islam? Um, I want to say in the following year because uh, I, I knew I was in an Islamic country, mm -hmm. but again, I didn't know too much about it. Uh, one of the things that I like to do if I have the opportunity is to travel. Mm -hmm. And to be, to be very honest, I was never expecting to come back to the Middle East. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised when my mother told me that the uh, company that my father was working for was hiring uh, because the job that I had at that time mm -hmm. uh, wasn't pairing very well. I wasn't getting anywhere at all. I told her I think about it, and then <coughs> about a, a week later, I was on a plane flight for Kuwait. <laughs> okay, welcome. <laughs> and okay. but um, but from what I can remember, still, uh, I try to remember as well as I can. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's okay. And now, the, the, our our qu my question is about Islam. What attracted you to Islam when you came to Kuwait? I think. Originally, when I was living in the States, uh, this was after 9-11 had happened. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting for, a story for me on that level. Uh, but anyway, the uh, thing that I noticed was the level of hatred for one particular religion. And mm -hmm. it's like, I wasn't religious. I was brought up in a Catholic or a Christian setting. I don't know exactly which. Mm -hmm. I went to Episcopalian schools when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Sunday school, did all of that, um, except for memorizing the Bible, obviously. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't understand why so many people all over the world hated Muslims. And one, the only other thing that I could relate to that is the early 1900s treatment of African Americans in the United States. I okay. see. And but at the same time, I knew that if I wanted, if I chose to search on my own about Islam in the States on the internet, I knew more than likely already that if I learned something incorrectly, I would have to relearn it. Okay. As a Muslim or, uh, or no, you were some other situation. You were only researching. Yeah. Okay. So 9-11 so influenced you to research more about Islam. To a degree, yes. Okay. Okay. And then what happened next that attracted you and made you think about it as a religion for you? One of the most interesting situations that happened to me was due to various reasons I was caused to run away from home, something I'm not exactly proud of. If I had been a Muslim at the time, I wouldn't have done it. Okay. But what, ha one, what happened to me two different times. One, uh, when I was leaving my house, going basically north, I didn't really have any aim. <laughs> <laughs> no location. Uh, yeah. I remember this one particular trip uh, it, that I covered about, I want to say, maybe 50, 60 miles in four days. Okay. And during those four days, this was in either February or January. I don't remember exactly which, but either way, uh, it was below freezing and it was raining. Uh -huh. I don't know how many viewers are familiar with the weather in Texas, but down on the coast in January and February, it, is, it gets very cold. Okay. Um, I remember uh, being soaked through to the skin. And at that time, the only footwear that I remember having with me was a pair of sandals <laughs> <laughs> and four pairs of socks. <laughs> That's not enough. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so if you're ever thinking about running away for whatever reason, although I highly recommend you do not. Okay. <laughs> I was fortunate that I didn't have anything bad happen to me. Good, yes. Uh, I decided to sleep under a bridge to get out of the rain. And I had a sleeping bag with me. Okay. The one thing I knew about a particular situation about that is that you could easily catch pneumonia. Okay, yeah. I never got sick. Yeah. And, I sh and by rights, I, as far as I'm concerned, I should have. Yeah, this is good. Now, what, is, uh, what's, uh, uh, what this has to, to do with 
with your decision uh, to think it, seriously? It didn't trigger anything immediately, but later on, after I had more experiences, mostly things that could have required me going to a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, like for one example, I heal pretty well, but even so, when you have your jaw uh, from a trip, I, I got a tripped myself. Okay. Uh, when you have your jaw shifted literally up to here without breaking the bone, and not seeing and not being able to talk or do anything or anything like that for about two days, and then having it healed on the third day, it's got to be a miracle in itself. Okay. And to make it even more interesting, no medication, no X-rays, nothing. Ah. <laughs> and for me, uh, that was just flat out amazing. <laughs> uh huh. And what this has to do with with your decision to study and research more? Again, I, I still didn't really have much of an interest in Islam, mm -hmm. but what really, uh, the final point, what really pushed me more into wanting to know more about Islam in the future when I had the chance was one of the places I used to walk past for about six to eight months. Uh, I said earlier that I used to go to church, uh, to church and Sunday school and all mm -hmm. that. I would pass by this one particular church with a, uni with a university on the other side, on the right side. And I never felt anything walking on the church grounds. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, I don't know if people believe in coincidence or not, I don't. Uh, I stepped on the, pro on the property of the church on the sidewalk. And I noticed that there was like some sort of weird feeling like I was in danger. Okay. Uh, which didn't make sense because... So you were afraid? Yeah, but I didn't know why because okay. this, the environment that I was in, uh, there was no people, there were no cars, there weren't even any insects okay. that I can remember of. So suddenly you were afraid? Yeah. And then? Each step that I took on the, on the sidewalk, it kept on getting stronger and stronger and then finally I just started looking around and when I looked towards my left where the church was, it's basically like a truck hit me. I automatically went to my right. And it was the feeling of danger was so strong. I had to be, I had to be in the street literally and then I didn't feel anything. Very interesting. <laughs> Dear viewers, we will continue with this very interesting uh, s story of our brother, Mr. Ali from United States after the break. Stay tuned. Dear viewers, welcome back. We are enjoying this conversation with our brother, Mr. Ali Tainar from United States and his first impressions and reasons to be a Muslim. So Ali, tell me, you were walking outside near, to, near a church and you had that sudden fear that you couldn't explain even though you told me that you were a person that is hard to scare, to be scared. As far as I'm concerned, yes. Okay, <laughs> so how do you relate this to your uh, uh, mentality mm -hmm. or thinking about Islam? One of the first, th uh, one of the early things that I learned was that the created uh, being should only fear the Creator, which is Allah, okay. Subhanahu wa Taala. And sometimes I forget that, but more than I think, more often than not, I'm reminded at some point okay. that I should be afraid of only Allah and not an animal or another person or anything like that. Okay. How is that connected to your, 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 uh, um, your coming to Kuwait and Islam itself? When I use and sometimes see um, Muslims, uh, Muslim brothers or even sisters mm -hmm. uh, in places like Syria or Afghanistan, for example, 
the ones that are actually doing the fighting, they don't look scared. Mm -hmm. I try, one, of the, one of the things I remember trying to do was going through mil military training for the Army. And there was only one time I felt that I was at peace for temporarily, and uh -huh. then afterwards I didn't feel anything. It was so, when I went to a church service, basically just to let go of stress. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> what I noticed early on after I became a Muslim in the Emirates was that that peace was almost as high as what I felt the first time I prayed in a mosque as a non-Muslim. Oh, you, you, so, so when you came to Kuwait, you went to pray even though you were a non-Muslim? No, no, the first time I prayed was in Sharjah, the UA, in the UAE. Okay, you were in, in uh, UAE? Yes. Okay. And the only reason why I was there was, as I was hoping to mention, um, I was interested in a particular sister for marriage. Okay, so you <laughs> but, went for marriage yeah, but to at that UAE. But at that time, I didn't know that a non-Muslim man couldn't marry a Muslim I see. woman. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but regardless, she helped me learn a little bit more about that from what she knew. Okay. And she started pressing me more to go to the mosque and just pray and because of my reaction at the church in the United States, I was a little hesitant as I, people, oh, I wonder what people are thinking right now. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I eventually go in and even on the way in, I didn't have the feeling that I was expecting to have. Okay. I was very much at peace. I see. When I went inside. Inner peace. Inner peace. Okay. I was very comfortable, even though slightly nervous because it was something new. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and I remember a Muslim brother, I don't remember his name anymore, unfortunately. Uh, he asked me if I was Muslim, and I said no. And he asked me if I wanted to pray, and I said, sure. I think I said, sure, why not? Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And he showed me how to pray when it was Maghrib time. It was mm -hmm. the first prayer I've ever prayed. <laughs> okay. And it felt like nothing I'd ever felt in church. Because in church, from what I remember, you kneel. Uh, most Christians and, uh, Christians and Catholics, mm -hmm. they, they kneel on their knees. Yeah. And now that I'm thinking about it, I remember having a lot of pain from that. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was prostrate down on my forehead and my hands, I was very comfortable. I see. And I, went, I wasn't expecting that. Uh -huh. At that point, I didn't even know how Muslims prayed, I think. Okay. So now, now you are connecting that the sudden fear that you had before experience, that experience, with the feeling of peace yes. that you had when your first time went to the masjid to pray. Yes. Okay. And later on, what influenced your decision to become a Muslim? What made you decide it's the time now? Basically, I think, yes, because... <laughs> that experience. Yeah, okay. because uh, ba uh, soon after, uh, again, I still didn't know too much about Muslims or praying or even how to become a Muslim mm -hmm. at that time. I didn't know about the Shahada Okay, and when I learned the first time I learned about it I didn't realize that you had to have two witnesses. I see <laughs> or or more uh -huh. I forget exactly why I did it three times <laughs> Okay, The first time was in Sharjah the second time was in Texas at my family's house mm -hmm. during vacation but the official time was with a brother named uh, Muhammad al Nakawi mm -hmm. here in Kuwait. In Kuwait. Uh, at a mosque near the Thais Center. I see. And I was completely uh, surprised 
by everybody just reaction. basically everybody's reaction. Yeah. I didn't know what to expect. That, that's my, my, my second question. How, how Muslims reacted to your shahada? Have you ever seen how a beehive is? Okay. Kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. was it good or bad or overwhelming? What type of it? It was exciting, I'll tell you that. It was, there was a very high adrenaline rush. It's like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about this. <laughs> so it was good beyond your expectations. Yes. Let's put it this way. Never imagined it. <laughs> okay, okay. And That's I used to have quite the imagination. <laughs> exactly, okay. Uh, how soon you informed your family about your decision? Definitely within the year. Okay, uh, what was their reactions? I have a somewhat uh, predictive mentality. I like to try to figure out what people are going to do. I'm trying to figure out the exact word, but it's going to take me too long to figure it out, so I'm going to just let it go. Uh, I try to figure out how people are going to react to certain things. Okay. And more or less, I wasn't really disappointed or even surprised, but if in the in the ways that I was surprised, it was the certain it was certain people that I was surprised by. The two the people that really surprised me the most in not wanting to see me, not wanting to talk to me. Okay, so you had some uh, negative yeah. reactions. Those people were my grandparents. I see. And I was very hurt by that. Uh huh. I know that things could have been worse. I know that there's other new re newly reverted Muslims who've been beaten by their family. Oh. They've been starved. Because I live here in Kuwait, uh, I didn't have to deal with that. If my father decided to give me trouble, uh, <laughs> I, I tend to have a, I used to have a habit of just going to my room and closing the door. Okay. And just dealing with the, uh, and coming out when I was ready. I see. I am a very peaceful person. You have to remember this. Mm -hmm. Even when I was a non-Muslim, I didn't pick fights. I see. And if I was forced to defend myself, even then I would probably do it very reluctantly. I see. But if I knew that if somebody else's life was in danger or an animal's life was in danger, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, I'm going after that person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, now, uh, uh, after your shahada, what was the first Islamic worship you practiced? Oi, that, that's a difficult question. <laughs> that's an easy question. Uh, well, as I said, I, I think one of the first things I was, I was being taught was the pillars of Islam. Okay. Unfortunately, I have a, bar a very bad memorization skill. And I've only been able to memorize Al-Fatiha and Al-Ikhlas mm -hmm. because I know that for prayers to be valid, you have to recite Al-Fatiha. And I know about pain, uh, I know about zakat. I see. And worshiping none other than Allah, and knowing that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was his prophet and final messenger. I see. Okay, now looking back at your decision to become a Muslim from the point of now, how do you see your gains and losses? On a family level, it showed me who I can trust. It showed me who I can depend on, which unfortunately is maybe one or two people. Okay. And it also showed me more that I need to be more, on a family level, more self-reliant on my part. I see. My, I do come from a good family. I'm not trying to give the impression that they're bad. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> as I think for my gains, I, I could say is that for the most part, I think I'm more sympathetic towards how other people feel, okay. even though I have a hard time showing it sometimes. 
I see. Because the way I used to be, or actually I still am, what am I saying? Mm. <laughs> um, I've always been very supportive of people. I remember one instance where so, uh, some kid that I knew, I wouldn't say I was friends with him, I was more of an acquaintance with him, mm -hmm. um, but I knew him pretty well. Uh, he came to me about uh, wanting to commit suicide. Oh. And that was actually one, I've, one of the things I knew in, in Christianity that was said that if you do that, you're going straight to hell. Oh. And I also eventually came to realize the same thing was for the same in Islam. I see. And the, re the reason why he wanted to commit suicide was because his girlfriend w had been with, a, w with his best friend. Oh. I'm not going to go into details. No, no. Uh, <laughs> okay. But so he thanked me afterwards because, unfortunately, I wasn't experienced at that time. So, uh, so now, now what, what do you consider as a gain, again, again, what do you consider as a gain? Seeing, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think reciting the Quran okay. and learning more about Islam and understanding what it is that new Muslims are going to have to go through. Some people, some families are fully accepting it, even though they don't want to be Muslim. Uh -huh. And at the same time, there's families who are fine with Islam and eventually accept it. Okay, I mean, I mean your personal gains and losses. I know I have them, but <laughs> I didn't think of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's mostly just being more peaceful at heart. Okay being more peaceful at heart, that's a gain. Uh